Isaiah 55 is our text, Isaiah 55. So this Advent season, we are looking at the gospel, the message of the gospel through the book of the prophet Isaiah and looking at what the prophet Isaiah have, has to say to us about not just the first coming of Jesus, but also the second coming of Jesus. And as we prepare to celebrate Christmas with one eye on the birth of Jesus, remember why he came the first time. And with the other eye on his return, we'll continue to look through the lens of the prophet Isaiah to see just how good the good news of the gospel really is. And our text this morning allows us to get a clear picture, a better focus, a crisper understanding that all of us, every one of us in this room, we've been invited to the most the greatest banquet of all time. Isaiah 55, verse 1, says it this way. It says, Come, everyone who's thirsty, come to the water. And you without silver, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without silver, without cost. Now listen, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, it seems like all we do is eat, right? I mean, it's just one meal after another. And I personally really like having a nice meal. Some of you guys are big into those um, tests that you do, whether it's Enneagram or Strength Finders or love languages. Now, I know this isn't one of the love languages, but my love language is food, all right? You give me a nice meal, you have won my heart. Um, you invite me over to your house, and it doesn't even have to be nice. Just let's just share a meal together, and I am happy. Invite me to your place for dinner, and you've got a friend for life. But the invitation here in Isaiah 55 is not an ordinary invitation. It's In fact, it's breathtaking if you look at it for a second. It's enthusiastic. It's urgent. It's better than anything you and I can imagine. It's emphatic, and it's one dinner party that we should not miss. This is the party that you clear your entire calendar for. And notice the invitation is given about four times in the, just that first two verses here. Come, all of you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk. What an invitation. It's an amazing invitation from God above to each and every one of us. And it's open to everyone. Friends, you don't have to work hard to get on the VIP list to be invited to this party. You are the VIP. And God invites you. And while you read this text, there is an inner mingling of both the singular and the plural tense here. It's directed to you individually, but it's also, um, if you're a native Texan, which many of you guys are not, this is an inv invitation for y'all. This is for y'all, right? It's supposed to be for us, for me individually, but for y'all together. But friends, we're not supposed to just hear the invitation. We're not supposed to just open the envelope and leave it on the island and one day hopefully respond to it. This invite demands a response from us. And you'll see in our text these words as you read the next several verses. It says, listen, listen to me. Delight, pay attention, come to me, listen that you may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. There's a sense of urgency in this passage. And we'll see this morning, there's a, this is a tremendous invitation. This is for you and this is for y'all. And this is nothing less than an invitation to seek Jesus from God himself. Three things I just want you to notice from this text this morning really quick. Number one, this is an invitation to seek true satisfaction. This is an invitation to seek true satisfaction. Listen again to verses 1 and verse 2. It says, come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water. And you without silver, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without silver, without cost. Why do you send, spend silver on that what is not food and your wages on that what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good and enjoy the choicest of foods. Now listen, when the invitation here 
cries out to everyone who is thirsty. The point isn't that there are some people who get thirsty and need this drink. The point is that there are only some that will recognize their thirst. They'll recognize that they're really thirsty, and they will come to Jesus as the only one who has promised that whoever drinks of the water that he gives will never thirst again. And what's being spoken here in verse 1 isn't just a, about a physical hunger or a physical thirst and the corresponding nourishment that follows, but the prophet is speaking of a deep spiritual hunger and longing that we have for something more, a longing for an ultimate satisfaction, security, and salvation that we often look to other things to find. Sometimes we don't recognize we're hungry. Maybe we push the big questions of life to the side or we become too busy with the day-to-day mundane things of life to maybe think about those. Or maybe sometimes these questions are painful for us to even to begin look at, looking at them. Sometimes we tricked ourselves into thinking that we aren't hungry or thirsty simply because we have sought nourishments from things that do not last at all. I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases this verse in the Message Bible. He says, why do you spend your money on junk food, your hard-earned cash on cotton candy? I love that. Remember, Isaiah is writing to a group of people who are living in exile in Babylon. They, because of their sin, have been taken bond, in bondage to Babylon. But this isn't like slavery like Israel experienced in Egypt. In Is- Egypt, they were in forced labor. They were suffering. But in Babylon, life was actually good for them. They began to accumulate wealth. They began to buy homes. They, they had people in their group that began to become people of influence and position. Nehemiah, Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were all folks who were in this empire, but they were doing well in that community. In fact, they were doing better in exile than they were back home in Israel. Many of them were placed in prominent positions and accumulated great wealth, and life was good. And you know, for most of us, especially living here in the U.S., life is good. Life isn't bad for most of us. Life is pretty good. Compared to the rest of the world, we have it made. Most of us have homes and foods on our plates every single day, and our kids get good education, and for the most part, they're relatively safe. And so when we hear the invite from the prophet to say, come who are thirsty in our minds, we're like, we're okay. We're good. We're satisfied. But you know how it is when you fill your stomach up on junk food, isn't it? Your belly is full, but you're not really satisfied. When you drink soda, you don't really get quenched at the end of it. In the end, you're actually just poisoning yourself, truth right there, with artificial sweeteners and flavors and fillers. And let's be honest, when you're munching away at a bag of chips and you're chugging away that quote-unquote soda that basically takes, tastes like medicine, a.k.a. Dr. Pepper, and somebody says... Um, hey, I'll give you a fresh, healthy meal of collard greens and squash and organic, organic tofu and, for, and all of this for free. We're like, that's okay. We're good, right? We don't need that. See, I think that's why it's hard for us here in comfortable U.S. to really buy sometimes into the kingdom of God that invites us into everyday living with Jesus to say, hey, would you come broken needy, thirsty, and I will give you what, you can nev- what can never satisfy you. See, we have the tendency in our culture and in our society to take good things and turn them into God things. And they give us the illusion of being full, but always leaves us wanting, just like junk food does. Our finances, our resources, our materials can be a great gift, but rely on them for your ultimate satisfaction, for your ultimate security, for your ultimate salvation. And friends, they will leave you on your own. Your relationships can be an incredible gift from God for you, but rely on them for your ultimate satisfaction and security and salvation. And friends, they will disappoint you. They will fail you. Your careers that you pursue can be a great gift, 
but rely on them for your satisfaction and your security and your salvation, and they'll disappoint you. Your family and your friends are incredible blessings in your life, but if you rely on them for satisfaction, if you rely on them for joy, if you rely on them for security and salvation, if you rely on them for your identity, they're going to leave you wanting. So this is why God says through the prophet Isaiah, why spend money on that which is not bread? It's fake. It's not even real. Why labor for that which does not satisfy? There's plenty of that in our world. It can give an illusion of satisfying us, but friends, they never really will. Time and time again throughout the history of Israel, they turned to all sorts of things to find salvation. And each and every single time, these idols promised them something that ultimately failed them. They satisfied them temporarily, but then they disappointed. What are the idols that you think that you have to have for you to have a good life? What are the things that you would say, God, if you would just give me this, then life would be good? Can I again tell you that if that this, that fill in the blank is not Jesus, whatever you're pursuing will fail you will disappoint you, will leave you wanting. And you can mask that hunger in all sorts of ways. You can deal partially with your appetite. You can distract you from, those, from, distract you from what your true hungers really are. And you can even delude yourself into thinking that you don't need God, but they'll never live up to that promise. But God has invited us to a banquet that satisfies us forever. And Isaiah is longing for us to see two things in this text. He wants us to see the reality that we are thirsty. We are. All of us are trying to find our identity in something. But the second thing he wants us to see is that this meal that God is offering, we cannot pay on our own. We can't afford it. Friends, if you don't recognize that you're thirsty you'll never be fed. But if you recognize your thirst and try to satisfy, you, satisfy it on your own, you'll always be left wanting. And here's where God's offer is so amazing because he says what I give you will satisfy you and it will not cost you anything. The descriptors that we read of the meal in this verses are astounding. Wine. Milk, these are both symbols of richness and abundance. We're told that when we come to God's banquet, we're eating what is good. We'll delight in the best that the most richest man in the world could put on the table. The meal is so good that there's no way that we could pay for it on our own. And yet it's abundantly clear that someone has paid for it. Isaiah is saying in life, you can spend plenty and end up eating really what accounts to nothing. But with God, you don't have to spend a single thing, and you can eat till you are fully satisfied. This is why it says, without money, without cost. When I was in college, I was poor. I, McDonald's was luxury for me. Um, and so one of, these, one of those years, one of my friends, my roommates, invited me to go and spend, um, he was from uh, Zimbabwe, and he had a host family in San Antonio, and he said, hey, why don't you come, and we can go hang out with this host family. And so me and my two roommates drove down to San Antonio, and when we get there, after an eight-hour drive from San Antonio, we sit, and we're hungry, we're starving, and then the host family says, hey, let's go out to eat. And so we're like, all right, let's go. And so this family takes us to this restaurant, a pretty nice restaurant. It's called Texas de Brazil. I don't know if you've ever been there. And they're explaining to us how this meal works. And so there's this like a coaster thing with a red side and a green side. And so if you keep it on the green side, they just keep bringing you meat after meat after meat, right? And there's like steak and there's bacon wrapped chicken. And friends, I was in heaven at the moment. And all of a sudden, there's all this meals coming. And I was terrified to eat for two reasons. Number one, I didn't know if I had to pay for every single meat that they were giving me, right? And I was like, I'll take one, beat and one piece and that's it, right? And the second thing was the host never communicated to us whether he was paying for it or not. 
right? And so for all of those reasons, I was very hesitant until my roommate said, why aren't you eating? And I'm like, I don't have money to pay for this. And he goes, why are you worrying about that? You were invited here. Enjoy it. And all of a sudden, that coaster was on the green side for the rest of the night, right? I was enjoying every piece of meat that I could enjoy. And then um, the bill came. I never even saw it. I had a really good meal. It didn't cost me a penny. But it cost someone a lot. That's the point of Isaiah 55. God is saying, you've been filling yourself with McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's, and they never satisfy you. And what I'm offering you is better than Texas Day Brazil. It's so much better. You thought you were full. You thought you were content. You thought it was nice um, what you were eating, but you've never tasted real food. You've never tasted what I'm offering you. The things that you find your joy and your identity in have left you wanting, friends. You've pushed the hunger so deep down that you don't deal with it. You looked for life, you looked at, for life in things that have no power, but if you come and eat at the banquet that Jesus is offering you, not only will you be totally satisfied, but you will be able to enjoy it because the price of the meal has already been paid for. Jesus in the gospel says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never thirst, will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Friends, the invitation to the banquet is an invitation to seek true satisfaction. Secondly, this invitation is only available through revelation with God, through relationship with God. This invitation is only available through relationship with God. The meal has been paid for. The transaction is complete because the suffering servant who Isaiah foreshadowed has made provision for us to feast with him through the cross of Calvary. Seeking Jesus is seeking true satisfaction through relationship with God. Look at what verse 3 says. The prophet says, pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make a permanent covenant with you on the basis of the faithful kindness of David. This would be very easy for us to overlook, but it's essential for us to recognize just how relational the language of this chapter is. It's a very intimate chapter. The entire chapter is a personal conversation that God is having with his people. In the past, God made a covenant through King David. And it was that the people would have a permanent household, a homeland, safe from threats. But because Israel would not keep their end of the con- covenant, the end of the contract, and they would not fulfill their part of the covenant of being faithful to God, they always found themselves in bondage and in exile. And even though they strayed away, and even though they wandered away, we see a God that was always ready to forgive and relate not just to one person, but through the entire community in an everlasting covenant that wasn't dependent on them, but it was dependent on him. Friends, this is not about how well you perform. This is about the faithfulness of God's love, the faithfulness of God's words, the faithfulness of God's initiative that will bring this promise to completion. Verses 10 through 13, which we'll look at in a second, will give us a certainty that just as God's word does not return void, we can be absolutely certain that God will bring to promise everything that he's promised. God will bring to fulfillment everything that he's promised. And while the covenant with David had been Israel's hope of salvation, a hope amidst their exile that they would return to their home, God was doing something new and drawing them into a relationship once more. Not temporarily, but for eternity. Not by their own efforts, but secured by God himself. Not just for themselves, but for the entire world, which includes me and y'all. For God promised through David that one day, a descendant of David from his line would come and bring satisfaction and security and salvation that all of us have hoped for. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says, since I've made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander of the peoples, so you will summon a nation who you do not know, 
and nations who do not know you will run to you. For the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, has glorified you. Who would be that witness? Who would bring these promises to fulfillment and open a way for all to come? Who would be the one that was a long-awaited king, a servant for whom the nations would flock to, someone who God himself would glorify? Friends, there's only one name. Who is the true king, the true servant, the true descendant, the one who is truly glorified, the rich feast, the banquet that we've been invited to is summed up in one name, and that's Jesus. And that's Jesus. It means that every covenant that's promised here in Isaiah is open to you and is open to me. And we can be certain of that, not because it was signed by our efforts, but because it was signed by the death and resurrection of Jesus. We've been invited not to seek out some moral improvement plan where we can get our life better, but we've been invited to get on board with what God is doing and what God has done and what God will do in your life and my life. And friends, that's available to you. In fact, that's available to you right now. The invitation to seek is an invitation to seek true satisfaction that's only found in a relationship with God through Jesus And the third point, this invitation is to seek now. It's one that you seek now. Look at verse 6. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he may be near, while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his ways and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord for he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will freely forgive For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. This is God's declaration. Let me caution you on one thing here. When you hear the command, seek the Lord, you may be tempted to think that you have to go and search for God, that God is playing this incredible cosmic hide-and-seek or where's where's God, right? Where's Waldo? Where's God? That's not what the scripture is saying here. God is not hiding. But, what, but that's not at all what seek means in this text. Seeking is not looking for that which is lost. It's committing to what you know is already there. But friends, God has already gone to incredible great lengths to seek you out. And he doesn't coerce you. He doesn't drag you. He invites you to the feast. He invites you to the banquet and the time to RSVP, the time to respond to the invitation, friends, is now. Notice there's a sense of urgency in this text that there is a time-limited opportunity. Seek the Lord, not when you get a chance, not when your schedule gets easier, not when you get around to it, but seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The image that's being used here is the imagery of the temple. The doors are wide open, and you can go as long as the door is open. But friends, the door will eventually close, so go now. Go while you can. And it's a message that was not only carried on Jesus' lips, but it was fulfilled by Jesus. Jesus says in Mark 1, he says, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come. Would you repent? Would you believe the good news? Friends, don't wait till you drifted away. Don't think that you have time one day to respond. The passing of our dear friend Brian this past week should be a Reminder that we know, you and I don't know the days that have been assigned to us. Respond to the invitation now. How do you do it? Isaiah says, call on him. Forsake your ways, forsake your thoughts, which is to say turn from what you think will find you joy and satisfaction and turn to God and f- find joy and satisfaction and fulfillment in him. Trust in him. Trust in his plans for your life. Don't rely on your own strength and your own wisdom. But listen, his ways are not your ways. His ways are better than your ways. Maybe you're here and you think, well, God wouldn't want me. That I've messed up too much, that I've screwed up too much. But friends, that is simply not true. 
we often erect all sorts of barriers to God, even running away from God. But the invitation is God is saying, come. Come, feast. The wicked are those who oppose God's plans. They resist him. They resist his invitation. But God says, let go of your ways. Let go of your plans. Turn. Turn to me. For when you do that, when you come to God with genuine repentance, what you receive is not condemnation or judgment for all the ways you failed or screwed up, but what you receive is pardon. What you receive is forgiveness. What you receive is relationship with God forever. What you receive is that you become adopted where you look up and you can say, he's my father, I'm his son, I'm his daughter. So friends, can I invite you? Maybe you've been in church your entire life, but you have lost the joy of your salvation. You have forgotten what it means to find joy and identity and salvation in Jesus. And while you might say, I don't sin and I don't do a lot of crazy stuff, you found your identity in your work. You found your identity in your name. You find your identity in your wealth. You find your identity in your family. And Jesus says all of those will fail you. All of those are good things, but they will disappoint you. But if you come to me and find joy in me, in fact, Scripture says, seek first my kingdom, and all the other details of your life, I will take care of. But if you find satisfaction and joy in me, you will be full. You'll be full. The claim of Jesus is that he is the only way. There is no other way. He's the only one who can truly satisfy for which we ultimately thirst for. The text that we read from is from the CSB translation. It says that God will freely forgive us. But it literally means that God has abundantly pardoned us. That it's, he is more than sufficient. He has multiplied out our forgiveness. And he has addressed us to the deepest needs of our heart. But friends, we need to turn to him. As I close, let me just read the last few verses here. Verses 10 says, for as, high as, for as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating, without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat. So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in that what I send it to do. And you will indeed go out with joy and you will be peacefully guided the mountains and the hills will break into singing before you, and all the trees of the fields will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, a cypress will come up. Instead of the briar, a myrtle will come up. This will stand as a monument for the Lord, an everlasting sign that will not be destroyed. Friends, you and I have been invited to the greatest banquet of all time. It will not leave you hungry. It will not fail to satisfy you. It will not run out of food. And you don't have to pick up the tab. All you need to do is RSVP. So often we delay in RSVPing these days in hopes of something better coming along our ways. But can I tell you that there is no better offer than what Jesus gives. Because only in him and through him will you find ultimate satisfaction, security, and salvation. What he has begun, 
he will bring to completion. And he wants you to be a part of it. And this morning, the invitation is that you would trust him instead of all the other things in your life that will ultimately fail. And while he is waiting for your answer, he will not wait forever. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Jesus says in Revelation, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person and they with me. Would you make sure this morning before you leave here that you have RSVP'd to that invitation? Would you make sure that you know that you have RSVP'd, not because of all the good works that you do or how often you come to church or any of that stuff. I'm talking to you church folks, religious folks today. Would you make sure that you are you know that you're coming not because of what you've done, but simply because of what Jesus done, has done. In a few moments, the, there's an orchestra that's going to come up, and they're going to play a piece. And so we're going to delay on communion just for a second. But as they play, would you just meditate on the words? Would you picture... Would you picture just this huge banquet table with every food that you love, right? All the foods you hate are not there, just the food that you love. And there's a space that's reserved for you there. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you to say, have, you, have I RSVP'd yet? Have I responded? And if you haven't this morning, can I invite you to respond? And respond to Jesus. Because the invitation is for you. It's for you this morning.